So feel your body. Be aware of your feet touching the ground, the gravity. Be aware of your posture, whether you're sitting, standing, And just scan through your body and release any areas of tension as much as possible. Relaxing your shoulders. Relaxing your chest and abdomen. Relaxing your arms, your legs, your hands, your feet. And bring your awareness to your breathing. Just allow your breath to be completely natural without any conscious control. Simply observe the rise and fall of your breathing. as it changes from moment to moment. When thoughts arise, just notice that a thought in the mind has arisen, but without chasing after the thought, Just settle the mind, bring the attention back to the breath. As your mind gradually becomes more calm, you may become aware of different feelings or moods of the mind, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And you may become aware of the mind itself, the clear spacious mirror-like quality of consciousness that simply reflects whatever object you hold in awareness. Or you may become aware of different phenomenon, qualities of mind, various factors of enlightenment or hindrances, maybe a little sleepiness or a little excitement. But the important thing is to continually notice that all these different aspects of mindfulness have three things in common. They're impermanent. They lack any lasting satisfaction. And they are empty of existing, independent of causes, parts, mental labels. So keep noticing those 
three characteristics of existence, especially the lack of inherent existence. All the while you balance the factors of calming your mind using the breath as an anchor to your awareness. If you get lost or distracted or your mind gets too busy thinking about things, Don't worry too much about having a perfect meditation. It's just something you can play with and explore, keeping a very childlike quality of wonder and investigation. I wanna talk a little bit more about um, mindfulness and um, just say a few things first. You know, it's, um, it's always important to uh, ground our practice in um, an understanding of the Lam Rim. Um, you know, although these teachings are um, uh, found in both the Theravada tradition and the Mahayana tradition, um uh, uh you know the, so they share a lot of similarities except um you know the mahayana tradition has the bodhisattva path um but both are based on an understanding of refuge you know the the dissatisfaction of samsara and and uh developing a determination to be free from samsara um, recognizing the drawbacks of of chasing after samsara happiness, and and then you know once you contemplate that, along with an understanding of uh, death, you know the certainty of death, and and the effects of karma ripening at the time of death, you know then we. Um, you know, that naturally leads to wanting to find a safe refuge. Um, and, you know, understanding that only the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, can actually um, provide that safe refuge based, uh, especially on the Dharma teachings themselves, which is, which is the true, um, the actual refuge is, is the Dharma that the Dharma refuge, which, um, you know, the books and the teachings we receive, those are symbolic representations of refuge, but the actual refuge is internal, you know, whatever realizations of Dharma that we um, can internalize in our own mind, um, and that's that's all through practice, you know. It takes time to to develop that practice. Um, so that's that's why we're here. And um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah. So once we take refuge, the main commitment of refuge really is is uh, developing ethical discipline in our lives, you know, paying attention to the laws of karma. And that that has a direct effect on the quality of our meditation and our ability to um, progress further and, and realize more subtle, more difficult 
aspects of the path. Um, you know, the, the meditation on the four foundations of mindfulness, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's challenging, you know, I've, uh, you know, sometimes it seems like, uh, you know, the mind is um, really busy and agitated because, uh, you know, work and family, um, our minds are constantly thinking of a thousand different things, you know, uh, so many little details, um, you know, did I send an email back to that person? No, I have to, there's a fork in the sink. I forgot something, you know, just, you know, all the, all the cleaning and cooking and taking care of our body and, and, you know, our equipment, our clothes and car and so forth, our house or apartment, you know, all this takes a lot of time. However, um, you know, uh, to the extent that we can bring the four foundations of mindfulness practice into daily life, you know, as we are doing all these other um, seemingly mundane tasks that, that uh, are just, you know, uh, requirements of functioning and, and living in the world, um, we can use those activities for practice um, and especially these four foundations of mindfulness um, can be a real powerful practice as we go about through our daily life. I mean, it's it's one of those aspects of, of the Dharma teachings that um, you can see the entire Dharma teachings through just these four foundations, four foundations of, of mindfulness. Um, so, um, you know, last week, Venerable Yonten gave a talk on mindfulness of feeling. Um, there's a video posted that um, I found it quite helpful. Um, and I'll just review a few things um, from that and, and my own sort of uh, limited scholarship and, and um, uh, personal experience with, with some of the practice things I've remembered from other teachers. Um, <clears throat> so mindfulness is a mental factor and it simply, in its most basic meaning, it simply means not forgetting the object of meditation. Um, so, you know, that, that can be a real specific object of meditation, like, you know, focusing on the breath or feelings, or, or it can be kind of a more general meditation, like, um, remembering to be kind in our daily life, remembering to be patient, um, uh, so, and, and ultimately, you know, mindfulness is, is a tool that is used to build concentration and wisdom um, and the wisdom understanding emptiness is what actually uh, liberates us from cyclic existence. So, um, you know, that's a really good question about um, ego and Dharma practice. And, you know, at the end of the day, so I was just saying, um, in the Lam Rim, Lama Sankapa gives an example of, of uh, some practitioner in, in ancient Tibet. Um, uh, and he would um, look at his actions through the day. And for every um, negative action he did, he would place a black stone. And for every positive action, he would place a white stone and um you know it's not meant to kind of beat ourselves up and feel guilty but it's important to review your actions from the day and so just the fact that you are looking at your daily actions is a really wonderful practice um and you know, we have to be gentle with ourselves on the path and, and realize that it takes a long time. And, um, you know, we notice 
places where we uh, still need to work and um, uh, you know that's that's part of the practice of joyous effort was we just uh, we just keep at it and you know we can't expect perfection right away um, and um, you know the ego habit is is really strongly conditioned and it's not I was just having a conversation with a friend yesterday about um, how we, um, you know, his his uh, his boss was a, kind of being verbally abusive to him, and you know he he sort of made a remark to me. He understands that I practice Buddhism, and he says, "Well, you know, maybe if I understand no self, um, then there won't be any." any person here for mm -hmm. her to criticize. Um, and I was like, yeah, well, that's true in a way, but, you know, um, we don't want to completely negate the ego. Um, we actually, we actually need an ego in a conventional sense in in the world in order to function, in order to, um, you know, we can't just let people walk over us and, and abuse us. That's not skillful because um, we won't be able to be happy. Um, and it's important to have a little bit of happiness to um, practice Dharma. I, I understand what you're saying too. You know, Lon, Lon was just saying, you know, um, kind of along the same lines of it's important to have an ego. Um, and you know one one early meditation teacher um, in the United States, he's who's a psychotherapist. He he and a Buddhist. He said, "You need a healthy ego before you can transcend your ego." <laughs> um, but anyways, we're talking about a couple of different things here. You know, I know Ladon, you started talking uh, about just kind of reviewing your actions at the end of the day and. I sort of took the whole ego conversation in another direction. Um, but uh, yeah, the main point I think is just to be gentle with ourselves and, and, and what you're doing is really excellent. You know, just um, reviewing your day and trying to, and rejoicing in the actions that you've done well, that, that are in accordance with Dharma and without any guilt, um, you know, because guilt is just beating yourself up. It's not skillful. Uh, without any guilt, reviewing any things that you did that um, are negative actions, you know, any of the 10 negative destructive actions of body, speech, and mind, um, you know, that are tainted by, by those. And then, you know, make a determination to not to do them in the future, um, you know, or, or if you really want to, um, do it thoroughly, you know, then you can do the four opponent power purification where you, you know, you take refuge and you, you know, recall the negative act and, um, and, you know, you kind of with an understanding of why it's negative and, and then you do a remedial action, you know, some kind of prayer, um, uh, you know, in reliance on the the three jewels, um, but the but out of those four opponent powers, the most important one is is um, developing a genuine sense of regret. You know, of really understanding how that action is harmful and and not useful, um, and you know, from that, when you develop that real genuine sense of regret, then the determination not to do it again will naturally arise. Um, but it's just, it's tricky, you know, because cause, um, it's easy to get discouraged in our practice. So uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> um, I mean, it takes a while to develop pure bodhicitta. So, um, you know, I, I'm... Um, it's okay to allow yourself a little happiness. Um, uh, but, you know, 
try to just, you know, like I go hiking and, um, and it's kind of for myself, but I also try to think, okay, I need to do this in order to stay in balance and, and, um, help, and then I can help people more effectively. I also go out hiking because I see other sentient beings out hiking and I connect with the larger universe and, but you know, it's, it takes, uh, it's a lot of practice though to, to notice, okay, is this just my selfish motivation wanting my own happiness or am I really trying to do this for all sentient beings? And so it's, that's uh, a long-term practice. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So um, just, you know, talking a little bit more about the, the nuts and bolts of, of the meditation practice. Um, one of the real obstacles or challenges that we often face is um, during sitting meditation is, is uh, we get distracted by our thoughts and we get really involved um, and, um, and it's easy to lose focus uh, on our meditation um, and so it's important just to return to the breath and, and, you know, notice, okay, I got distracted again. Um, and to the extent that we can, um, you know, keep our mind somewhat even between meditation, you know, not, not fill our minds with lots of details um which is hard <laughs> in 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 our lives but you know that's that's why um retreat is so powerful as we can kind of set aside um you know our phones and our computers and and so forth um, um so <clears throat> When, when we can, you know, settle our minds a little bit more, then when a thought arises, we're more likely to see it with bare attention. Um, just that real pure sati quality of mindfulness. Uh, it's just as a thought, like, oh, okay, you know, my, my mind is a little busy and there's a thought, and there's a thought. And we're, we're less likely to get sidetracked are distracted, we can just observe the nature of the thought. The thought arises and then it passes away and and, and we can, it becomes part of the meditation rather than a distraction from the meditation. And so it, it um, uh, helps to build the calming factor of concentration and also the insight factor of meditation, um, the ins you know wisdom, these these two, over time, you know during the meditation they balance each other out, and we begin to see the impersonal nature of thought, um, because even the awareness of ourselves as a separate person or identity. When we slow down our thought process, we see that, well, that's just another thought also, you know, I, you know, or me or mine. And it might not be really conscious, um, but in our subconscious, we're still clinging to that, you know, these are my thoughts. This is my meditation. It's not going so good. You know, it's I, me, mine. And, uh, you know, it's just a slow, patient process of weeding that um, delusion, the, the fundamental delusion that keeps us trapped in samsara um, out of our minds. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, we think we've um, had really good meditation or something and we kind of, that thought isn't coming up so much, but it's, until we've actually pulled it out by the root, um, we just have to keep keep working at it. Um, 
uh, so Venerable Analio, where's that book? Um, oh, anyways, oh, not there. Oh, it's right there. Um, Venerable Analio and in, in the you know uh, book on the Satipatthana. Um, he points out that liberating insight can also occur by observing phenomena externally, that is another sentient being. So in the Satipatthana Sutra, which is um, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness, uh, uh, the training is to observe the phenomena, you know, the mind, um, body, mind, body, feelings, mind, and mind objects, you observe them both within yourself, but also in other people, um, which um, you, you, uh, in your sitting meditation, everything is internal, but you know, when during the course of your day and, um, and when you're interacting with other people, um, you can try to meditate, uh, you know, on interacting with other people, like you're just as these uh, four foundations, you know, my own body and has all these parts and, and, um, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's nothing findable in there. There's just, <clears throat> uh, you know, the breath is coming and going and different feelings are rising and passing away. And, you know, there's this clear mind, but when you look for an actual mind, it's just a series of moments. There's no, there's nothing solid in there. You reflect, oh, that's the same with this other person right in front of me, um, which can really help. <clears throat> Um, I don't know, it's just a really powerful part of practice because it's sort of a chance for us to apply our own internal practice into an interpersonal setting. You know, we, we realize, you know, the other person also is, is just composed of these different, um, aggregates and, and, uh, you know, they're all, um, impermanent, nothing satisfactory and empty. There's no, there's no solid person there. Um, and, uh, and the, the instructions in the sutra also talk about doing the, um, the internal and external contemplation simultaneously, which, um, which I think actually means kind of back and forth, you know, um, because unless you're a Buddha, I don't think you can understand it all simultaneously. <laughs> um, so you're kind of alternating. Um, so this also erodes our clinging to a separate self. When we begin to treat the experiences of others and ourselves in the same way. And so just like, you know, when we think of I and them or you or whatever, it all depends on perspective, just in the same way that um, if you're standing on a mountain and you look across the valley and you say, there's the other side of the valley, and this is this side of the valley, what completely depends on where you're standing, there's no, there's no ultimate or inherently existent this side or that side, same, same with I and other, it's, um, it's just, uh, you know, ultimately comes down to words and language and concepts and perspective or on where, you know, um, you know, this, I, this idea, okay, this, this mind's in here, and so therefore it's an I that's separate from that mind over there. And um, 
so and it, i'm probably not explaining it really well but it's um it's interesting to kind of explore that uh you know these teachings in the context of of being with other people and you know whether they're strangers or friends or um neutral people um and it can be challenging you know if if uh especially if you're like say in a job interview or meeting with your boss or landlord um uh, but um uh, so may maybe uh don't start there you know do it just in more kind of calmer situations you know at the checkout line with a cashier you know try and contemplate okay this person is um has this same process of of uh you know these different aspects of of reality are happening in the same way as they are with me um Uh, external contemplation of the four foundations also reduces our tendency to become self-centered, um, <clears throat> which uh, you know can can be a challenge to our Mahayana aspiration. Um, you know, uh, and so so it can really help help our bodhicitta basically to um uh think about these four foundations in in other people so here's just a quote from venerable analio once contemplation is practiced both internally and externally it entails a shift towards a comprehensive type of practice. At this stage, even the boundary between I and other, or internal and external, is left behind, leading to a comprehe comprehensive vision of phenomena as such, independent of any sense of ownership. So it's just really interesting how how we always tend to own our experiences. Oh, this is my experience right now, and and uh, you know it's that real subtle um, clinging to inherent existence that um, is uh, difficult to remove. But but with steady practice, we just kind of chip away at it, and and um, you know, and there's countless aspects of our of our day that that can be turned into dharma practice um yeah just a uh, couple a week ago or so ago i was i was riding my bicycle and um <clears throat> i wasn't really thinking about anything and so then i was starting to think about feeling you know okay what am i feeling now is it pleasant or unpleasant um and i thought okay this is a little bit pleasant you know it's being outside and and um you know kind of a little uh moving my body and feeling the energy flowing and and then i um and i thought to myself oh okay i have a little bit of mindfulness now you know mindfulness is one of the seven factors of enlightenment it's one of those lists of you know there's um and so that brought up a little bit of a joy um which is also um it's on one of the lists joy is a really <laughs> important quality of practice having joy i think it it's um uh and um So, anyways, you know those 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 little moments in our day can can uh, um, can happen anywhere. Um, 
I think I skipped over something I wanted to say. So, um, so during meditation, uh, thoughts are not the problem. We need conceptual thought. However, we don't want to just be aimlessly reflecting on things, but skillfully noting within the Satipatthana mindfulness model. So in the sutra, it reads, quote, mindfulness that there is a body is established in him or her to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. And then, and then the sutra goes on, you know, and, and then when it gets to the feelings that that same refrain comes again, mindfulness that there are feelings is established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. Mindfulness that there is a mind is established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. Mindfulness that there are mind objects is established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. So you know the you know in, during our meditation the key is just to um, notice when these different four foundations are are arising you know some feeling or or just awareness of mind or mind objects without getting carried away and distracted with the content of of whatever those signify but just maintaining mindfulness just noticing okay you know, there's a feeling, it's a pleasant feeling, or, or there's, there's the awareness of, of mind. Um, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Um, Yang Sri Rinpoche is going to be leading a retreat on Mahamudra uh, in November. That's going to be online. Um, and uh, I don't know too much about it, but um, I remember um, part of the process of, of Mahamudra is, is first to recognize the nature of the mind. Um, and, but, and that's, that's quite, powerful to realize that but it's that's not a liberating insight the the nature of the mind just means the mind is clear and knowing and whatever object appears can arise in the mind it's just like this clear mirror um mahamudra um basically just means in my understanding, my simple, ignorant understanding, just you know, Maha is great, Mudra is seal. So it's the great seal, it's it's another way of understanding emptiness. Of so, so you notice that basic clarity of the mind, and you can rest your awareness in that, and. You know, the, the point of the Satipatthana meditation isn't to kind of continually just go around these four and keep noticing, oh, okay, there's a feeling, there's my, there's a pain in my foot, you know. Um, it's, it's to gradually focus your mind on, on the more subtle aspect of, of, you know, things arise and pass away, their impermanence and eventually to develop insight and along the way you're also concentrating the mind refining the mind and and so um i guess i would revise what i said earlier that thoughts aren't the problem i mean initially you just have to accept that thoughts are there and you notice and you use them in your meditation to understand the, the nature of your mind and that leads you to 
a calmer and calmer mind and a more insightful mind until finally you can rest your mind just in the nature of mind where you're in this really calm state without thoughts. You're not sleeping. You're not just like, um, you're not just like blanking out, spacing out, but you know, the mind is very sharp and clear and, and, but also not, um, it's just resting in that basic nature of, of, of consciousness. And then to, to make the leap to realizing Mahamudra is, is to realize that that clear nature of consciousness is empty not intellectually, but to see it directly within that really calm state. Okay, I said a lot of stuff there and all of that is um, footnoted with the fact that I'm a person of no realization and and not much study. So um, any any questions? I don't, I, I can't see, uh, does that all sound good? Or uh, confusing. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> see, I wrote a lot, but we don't have to talk the whole time. We can do some more practice. Um, yeah, during meditation, it's it's good to notice. <clears throat> when the hindrances to meditation are practiced. So that's that's one of the, the um, that's in the fourth category of mindfulness of mind objects or phenomena. So, you know, just noticing is there is there sense desire, you know, desire for any of the um, six uh, sense doors, you know, sights, sounds, tastes, touches, or, you know, um, s smells, you know, fragrances and, and mental objects, you know, that, that can be a real favorite of mine, you know, is, is wanting something to play with in my mind, you know, oh, I want to think about something, you know, and I want to, um, you know, so that, that, uh, that's just a desire for for wanting sense experience and and so just kind of noticing whether the mind is trying to reach out and grab onto stuff or if it can rest in its own basic receptive state um, or you know maybe there's some sluggishness or sleepiness or restlessness um, or um, maybe some resentment or ill will or doubt. So all these things um, we can bring into the meditation and just notice, you know, the first step to um, eliminating some obstacle in our meditation is we have to notice it, we have to see it. And so, um, you know, that's, that becomes part of our meditation. She, uh, uh, Lan was just sharing with her practice how when you notice some thought arising, um, uh, I mean, it's helpful just to notice, just to see it as a thought and then bring yourself back into your body and, and, um, and let go of the thought without chasing after it. Does that sound like a fair summary? <laughs> okay. Um, mm. Oh, and so anyways, you know, this this week and next week are are both about feeling. And then um, Venerable Children will be teaching in Seattle um, uh, Friday, Friday evening. So I'm not going to have a class on Saturday because... Um, I have to take Friday off from work to to pick her up at the airport, and um, she's actually giving two talks. But um, 
but anyway, so feeling, um, I haven't talked so much about feeling, um, today. Um, and one, one thing that's important, you know, uh, Venerable Yontan talked about it a little bit is it can be kind of elusive, difficult to locate, um, feeling and, and there's, the way she described it, um, you can look for feeling in your body, like a physical feeling and also a mental feeling, um, which is one way to explore it. I, I guess in my own thinking, feeling is always a mental quality. So it can come from your body or it can come from your mind. Um, like, um, so just to give an example, many years ago, this, um, Vipassana teacher was on a retreat and he said, um, he was sharing a personal anecdote from his life. And, uh, he said something about, <clears throat> um, uh, he'd kind of fallen into a little bit of a depression and, um, and it was just kind of wallowing in that unpleasant state of mind for, uh, for a while. And then, um, but then he used the practice just to realize, oh, it's just, it's just, uh, an unpleasant feeling of the mind. You know, it's just a feeling, you know, it's even though it's sometimes the moods can be quite subtle. And, and so he, uh, after labeling the feeling, then he began to observe it more closely, you know, to kind of, um, identify, try to kind of understand the feeling and, and, uh, you know, the basic point being that when you can kind of see with some Dharma awareness what's going on, and then you put that spotlight of Dharma awareness onto whatever you're looking at, eventually it will dissolve into, you know, it's impermanent and, and, you know, it's, um, and, uh, you know, he, he stopped, he stopped resisting the feeling too. He stopped, you know, trying to like push it away. Just like, okay. Um, just, just, I'm just going to observe it, you know, and, and notice it without rejecting it. And, uh, and as soon as you can let go of, of, um, you know, wanting things to be different than what they are in the present moment, you know, that's, that's like the doorway to nirvana of, of, of letting go of, of your ignorance and your, um, your sense of a separate self.